Good morning. My name is Susan Jagalko, and it is my privilege to serve as your worship associate. We are a liberal, progressive congregation, welcoming those who share the value of free thought and lifelong learning. United, we walk many different paths. As artist Frida Kahlo wrote, they thought I was a surrealist, but I wasn't. I paint my own reality. Welcome to Tapestry, a Unitarian Universalist congregation. May we all feel seen and heard and valued in this safe haven. Our minister, the Reverend Kent Doss, is not in the pulpit today, but will return in September. Currently, he is on a sabbatical study leave while pursuing his doctorate. This morning, we are very pleased to have as our guest speaker later on in the service, Gustavo Ariano, an award-winning writer, the editor of the OC Weekly, and the nationally syndicated column, Ask a Mexican. He's also a lecturer in the Chicana Chicano Studies at Cal State Fullerton, and he has spoken here several times and participated in service auction events for us. I admire his intellect, activism, compassion, humor, oh yes, and fearless writing. Kurt Vonnegut's uh, quote resonates when I think of, when I think of writers. Um, when a society is in danger, writers are likely to sound the alarms. They should be treasured alarm systems. Our theme for July is journey. Union analyst Marion Woodman writes, if you travel far enough, one day you will recognize yourself coming down the road to meet you, and you will say yes. Some of you know the story of uh, Richard's and my journey to Southern California almost 20 years ago. We retired as he was an air traffic controller. I was a substance abuse therapist, and we gave away most all of our belongings, sold our house, said goodbye to family and all of our friends, put our remaining belongings in a little red Miata convertible, and drove from Indianapolis to uh, out here singing California and the ocean, here we come. I just, when I say that, I just realize that that was, we were privileged because we had a safe journey. Oh yeah, and our kids finally found us. Um, <laughs> one of them, Matt, is with us today visiting from Austin, Texas. The first time I came to Tapestry, I felt overwhelmingly peaceful. We, uh, we both felt as though we finally recognized ourselves, and as in the Marion Woodman quote, we said, yes. And now, if you wish, you may check in with Facebook and mention how much you like our beloved community, and then please turn off all your mobile devices so we may have a contemplative atmosphere. We extend warm greetings to everyone. If you are a visitor, we invite you to stand and introduce yourselves. Um, heritage. We light our flaming chalice to illuminate the world we seek, an act that challenges us and focuses us to share more joy, build more justice, refuse to be indifferent, and to make peace. Please join in saying our covenant, followed by our song of affirmation. And I want to thank Carol Lickfett for subbing today for our music director. <laughs> Scientist by day, no, she says. Our celebrations, concerns, and sorrows are shared in support and in love, which is the essence of community. Uh, there were no specific requests, uh, slips of paper to note. Uh, I would say that a celebration is my husband Richard and I share joy over seeing for the first time last week our great-granddaughter. I cannot believe we are this old, but we have a great-granddaughter. <laughs> um, but the lit candles also represent our, they re represent our personal emotions, and we all hold them in our hearts. And now please join in the congregational response. For your joys, we join you in celebration. For your sorrows and concerns, may you feel our compassion.
And now the children are invited to join Caitlin Riva up front for the Time for All Ages. Pardon? It is. How did you know that? You've read it before? Uh, yeah, we went into a library and saw it. Oh, okay. She knows that this is a true story. So it's a poem based, maybe sit this way more, um, based on a true story that happened in Cuba in, 19, in the 1930s. So it's called Drum Dream Girl. You guys want to sit here, please? And then you can see better, okay? Right here on the floor in front of your sister. Go ahead, EJ. Perfect. Okay. On an island of music in a city of drum beats, the drum dream girl dreamed of pounding tall conga drums, tapping small bongo drums, and boom, boom, booming with long, loud sticks on big, round, silvery, moon bright timbales. But everyone on the island of music in the city of drum beats believed that only boys should play drums. So the drum dream girl had to keep dreaming, quiet, secret, drum beat dreams. At outdoor cafes that looked like gardens, she heard drum, drums played by men. But when she closed her eyes, she could also hear her own imaginary music. When she walked under wind-wavy palm trees in a flower-bright park, she heard the whir of parrot wings, the clack of woodpecker beaks, the dancing tap of her own footsteps, and the comforting pat of her own heartbeat. At carnivals, she listened to the rattling beat of towering dancers on stilts. So she heard music everywhere. And the dragging clang of costume drummers wearing huge masks. At home, her fingertips rolled out their own dreamy drum rhythm on tables and chairs. And even though everyone kept reminding her that girls on the island of music had never played drums, the brave drum dream girl dared to play tall conga drums, small bongo drums, and big, round, silvery, moonbright timbales. Her hands seemed to fly as they rippled, wrapped, and pounded all the rhythms of her drum dreams. Her big sisters were so excited that they invited her to join their new all-girl dance band. But their father said only boys should play drums. So the drum dream girl had to keep dreaming and drumming alone. Until finally her father offered to find a music teacher who could decide if her dreams deserved to be heard. The drum dream girl's teacher was amazed. The girl knew so much, but he taught her more and more and more. And she practiced and she practiced and she practiced until the teacher agreed that she was ready to play her small bongo drums outdoors at a starlit cafe that looked like a garden where everyone who heard her dream bright music sang and danced and decided that girls should always be allowed to play drums and both girls and boys should feel free to dream. So that is actually a true story of a woman, let's see what her name was in case you all want to know, I'll tell you. Uh, she was Chinese African Cuban named Milo Castro Zaldariaga, possibly. <laughs> but now women are allowed to play drums in Cuba. Um, all right, we are all going to the same class again today. We're going to be talking about the importance of toilets, which is really quite amazing. <laughs> all right, here we go. I don't know if anyone saw much of the convention of sorts last week, but well, <laughs> it seemed, there was a, I heard a lot of things that sounded very hateful. And so um, this is a song about hearing and paying attention to other things. Um, Rob and I have been playing it for years, and I think it's probably never more re relevant than now. It's called I Hear Them All. Crying of the hungry in the desert where they're wandering, hear them crying out for heaven's own benevolence upon them. 
I hear destructive powers prevailing, and I hear fools falsely hailing to the crooked wits of tyrants when they call. I hear them all, I hear them all, I hear them all. I hear the sound of tearing pages and the roar of burning papers. All the crimes of acquisition turned to wear and ash and vapor. And the rattle of the shackles far beyond emancipators. And the loneliest to gather in their stalls. I hear them all, I hear them all, I hear them all. So while you sit and whistle, Dixie, with your money and your power, I can hear the flowers growing in the rubble of the tower. I hear leaders quit their lying, I hear babies quit their crying, I hear soldiers quit their dying, one and all. I hear them all, I hear them all, I hear them all. Tender words from Zion, I hear Noah's waterfall, hear the gentle lamb of Judah sleeping at the feet of Buddha, and the prophets from Elijah to the old Paiute Wavaka take their places at the table when they're called. I hear them all, I hear them all, I hear them all. I hear them all, I hear them all, I hear them all. The reading today is just a brief excerpt from the Pulitzer Prize fiction winner Viet Thong Nguyen and writer Carlos Bulasan. Bulasan called on Americans to believe in the best of their rhetoric and not the worst of their practice. He reminds us that a nation without immigrants is a nation without a journey, without an imagination, a state that eventually turns to stagnation. Wen says, my America opens its arms to the world instead of selling the world arms. A country with a capacious humor and the humility to wonder if it is right. But I know another America exists, a more dangerous one. If that America wins, then we and the world lose. I can only add the words of Lynn manuel Miranda, love is, love is, love is, love, love is, love is. Now please take a moment to settle in and calm the mind with silent meditation. And now, our friend Gustavo Ariano. Hello, hello. I have a loud voice, so I have to pace myself. This, is, this will be good from here. Thank you all for having me here at Tapestry, uh, the only place in South County that, where I'm allowed to show my face <laughs> and advertise. I know, really, it's always a pleasure speaking to ustedes. And as Susan said, I, anytime you folks need me for anything, I'm more than happy to assist in whatever way possible. If that means being an auction item to have... <laughs> Hey, I loved it. We had a great time at La Rana at Aliso Viejo. I know a, a, a good, a, not, not a good, a great Mexican restaurant in Aliso Viejo. I didn't believe it either until we went. Absolutely amazing place. So thank you again for having me. My name is Gustavo Ariano. I am the editor of the OC Weekly. You could always pick us up around wherever you could find us, also online every day at ocweekly.com. And it, it's great to be able to talk about, uh, you know, to, to talk what I, what I call the path in Orange County from being a conservative hell to whether you want to call it a liberal heaven, I prefer progressive paradise to be a little bit more ecumenical. 
it's all good. But it's interesting because today I posted it on Facebook, just you know, sort of last minute invitation to any of my friends in South County, and immediately someone said, uh-uh, no way are we anywhere close to a progressive paradise. I mean, look at what's happening in Huntington Beach. And Huntington Beach, of course, its own special circle of hell, which we could deal with in a, in a bit. But as I told him, I didn't say by, you know, saying it's a path doesn't mean that we are progressive paradise yet. A path, what is a path if nothing else than something that has been created, something that wasn't self-evident, but something that still hasn't been finished to whether you want to call it the promised land, to whether you want to call it just a better place. That is what a path is. And definitely in Orange County, we do have a path. We can see something amazing that no one had ever even thought of before in Orange County. The land where Reagan said all the good Republicans go to die. Uh, the... <laughs> You know, the land of Barry Goldwater, of the Ku Klux Klan, of the Irvine Company, perhaps the biggest demon of them all. <laughs> so, so Orange County, even to this day, if you talk to people about Orange County, immediately you get all these stereotypes, some of them well-deserved, of being a place that's not hospitable to the good, to the light at all. But those of us who have, were born and raised here, those of us who have lived here for decades, those of us whose families have been here four or five generations, not more so, we, are test, we can testify to the fact of the amazing, not just journey, but path that has been created. A place now where to, uh, next week or this coming week at the Democratic National Convention, there are more uh, delegates for Bernie Sanders than there are Hillary Clinton which is in incredible. This is something that had, someone wants to applaud. The, the, young, the young millennial here <laughs> wants to applaud here. <laughs> it's amazing. If you had said 20 years ago, you know, when, when Bill Clinton was elected, that there was going to be more, more delegates for, if, coming from Orange County for the progressive candidate as opposed to the more quote unquote mainstream candidate, everyone would have laughed you out of the room. We're, we're now in a county that increasingly is becoming purple. A county where you could probably have two uh, Congress, uh, Democratic Congress people from Orange County, where you could have two assembly members, where you could have two state senators, where you could have finally, for the first time in a long time, a Democratic supervisor in the form of Michelle Martinez in the first supervisorial district. This is not something that just came out of nowhere, and frankly, this is something that no one ever thought. So what I want to talk about really briefly is how did we get to this path, or how was this path created? How did we get to the precipice of being able to be in a county that we could proudly call blue, that we could proudly call progressive, that we can proudly call not Nixon land anymore? I, you know, the long story of it, I have to do a shameless plug, but the long story of it, of course, is in a book that I wrote called Orange County of Personal History, which you could find in the bargain bin somewhere. <laughs> didn't sell well. And I, don't, I, I know why it didn't sell well, because frankly, it was a polemic. It was, po it was a polemic and told the truth about the Orange County that I was born and raised, the Orange County where my family has been in, in one way or another since the early 1900s, when my great-grandfather and my grandfather went to Anaheim to be able to pick oranges. My uh, great-grandfather quickly left because he, he couldn't stand the racism that, I mean, imagine being a Mexican in 1910, Anaheim, and he couldn't stand it, but left my, great, my grandfather to be, uh, to be raised there. He left as a young man, went back to Mexico, had his, you know, had his children, my mom and all my aunts and uncles, and came back. That, it's all in Orange County of personal history, but I just want to give a greatest hits, not so much my, about my family's own journey, but the, uh, you know, shout out to those amazing people who have helped cut the path to where we're at today. And there's so many, I mean, I can only speak of just a couple, and, and, but these are the ones who you should, once we're done, go back home, Google them, it's okay to take notes, and just read a little bit more about that. Uh, one person, one amazing person, it's, it's you know, it, 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 he is such an underrated, unknown figure in Orange County history, a former district attorney. I know, a good district attorney in Orange County? Perish the thought. But his name was Alexander Patrick Nelson. Alexander Patrick Nelson came uh, to Orange County in the early 1910s, became a district attorney or the district attorney in the early 1920s at a time when the Ku Klux Klan was in power across Orange County. When they had council majorities in La Habra, in Brea, in um, 
in Anaheim, of course, where it was an all-clan uh, city council, where there was crosses burning all across Huntington Beach, North Orange County, South Orange County. The Klan was ascendant. No one really wanted to take them on except this man, this district attorney named Alexander Patrick Nelson. Alexander Patrick Nelson went around the county and fought the Klan. He found a list, the membership list, of the Ku Klux Klan and read it out loud in public. For the, I know, again, for that, for reading that out, he was issued death threats. For that, the Klan burned crosses. The Klan flat out threatened him. Very few people wanted to stand by Alexander Patrick Nelson, but nevertheless, he stood tall. And eventually, the Klan was uh, the, the official Klan in 1924. They were driven out of office. They basically went underground for a long, long time. And then Nelson was forgotten by the history books. In fact, uh, I did a cover story about him for the OC Weekly a couple years ago. And in looking through oral, oral histories, there was one man who basically said, uh, Alexander, uh, you know, yeah, uh, Nelson wasn't the brightest of men. In in fact, really, he was hempecked. Uh, that was his legacy. That was his uh, rem remembrance of Nelson. No, he was a hero. He was a hero. He was someone who stood against the Klan at a time when it wasn't po politically convenient to do so. And of course, he was forgotten in Orange County. Another person, really a martyr to the cause, especially all of us who are people of faith and all of us who care about turning Orange County into a better place, was a gentleman by the name of Joel Vorman or D-V-O-R-M-A-N, however you pronounce it, sorry. I'll say Vorman. Joel Vorman. Joel Vorman was a school trustee in the Magnolia School District. The Magnolia School District is one of the smallest dist school districts in Orange County. It's really just a square block that roughly encompasses Stanton, Anaheim, Buena Park, and maybe a little bit of Los Alamitos. I can't remember, but I just it's an elementary school district. Joel Vorman was a World War II veteran. Uh, he was, uh, you know, was a veteran. He was a school teacher at Fullerton High school. He was also a member of the ACLU in 19, this would have been 1961, 1962 Orange County. But because of that, because, and I forgot to say he was also Jewish, because of those three sins for Orange County, he would not be allowed to survive. In fact, there was a recall movement put against Joel Vorman for the specific reason. I mean, the ostensible reason was because he held a meeting of the ACLU in his home. Seriously, that's why he was to be recalled. And not only that, people started pointing out, well, his front door is painted red. So obviously, that means he's a communist. <laughs> Joel Vorman was successfully recalled. The recall of Joel Vorman ended up turning, ended up becoming the spark that created Orange County's modern brand of conservatism, of crazy conservatism. One of the people who led the recall, uh, those of you who have been in the county might remember a kooky former congressman, not Bob Dornan, but the other one, not Dana Rohrbacher, but the other one. You guys remember John Schmitz? A couple of you, a couple of you folks do. John Schmitz. John Schmitz. He was the original crazy congressperson. He got his start going after Joel Vorman. The Orange County Register. It truly became notoriously nasty going after Joel Vorman. I, uh, all the ground troops of the, of the Barry Goldwater Revolution all organized around Joel Vorman to be able to take him down, and he he was taken down. Within a year, Joel Vorman died of a heart attack. His family and his widow forever since have blamed Orange County for taking away their father, their husband. Joel Vorman, again, forgotten by the history books. We were able to tell his story in the Orange County Weekly. I've told the ACLU for so long that they should name an award after Joel. They, they don't listen to me. Who listens to me? No one does. Sorry. <laughs> So many of these unknown heroes, you have, you know, we all know the case of Mendez et al. versus Westminster et al., the uh, 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 school desegregation case that served as the forerunner to the more famous Brown versus Board of Education. But a decade before that, you had a Mexican-American by the name of Alex Bernal who bought a house in Fullerton in an all-white neighborhood. He didn't realize that in his, uh, in, the, in the deed, it said that only white people could live in that neighborhood. No African-Americans. No Asians, no Mexicans, no Jewish folks, only white people. Within a week, his neighbors came and showed him what was going on in his housing covenant. Alex Bernal, who was born in the United States, said, I'm not moving, this is my house. Uh, a week later, someone broke into his house, threw out all of his furniture onto the front lawn. 
a month later, all of his neighbors sued him. How's that, being sued by your neighbors? Must be really nice, right? Sued him saying he is violating the law by merely buying this house. This is 1942, uh, uh, you know, 1942, 1943, Orange County. Amazingly, a judge found against the neighbors and in favor of Bernal. And the judge, I don't have the clipping in front of me, but we, again, we wrote this story in the OC Weekly. The, the judge said flat out, we're fighting against the Nazis in Europe right now, and Mr. Bernal's neighbors are acting like Germans, in the bad way Germans, not the good Germans, right? And so Bernal was able to keep his house. That also served as precedent for the much more famous housing covenant lawsuits that would be fought in the Supreme Court. Another great Supreme Court case that uh, dates back or uh, goes back to Orange County, Mulkey versus Reitman. Uh, two uh, two uh, uh, husband and wife in the armed forces, actually, you know, based out of here in El Toro, uh, Dorothy Mulkey and her husband. African-American couple in late 1960s, Orange County, they wanted to rent an apartment in Santa Ana. Their uh, landlord declined, you know, did not allow them to rent, and then, of course, rented out to a white couple. They ended up taking their case to the Supreme Court. It overturned, uh, you know, it overturned, what was the proposition? The Rumford Fair Housing Act in California that basically, or no, it overturned whatever overturned the Rumford Fair Housing Act, which allowed landlords to discriminate based on race. All these great, amazing pioneers in Orange County that have led us to this present, you know, to the present day, a path to getting an Orange County future. And of course, you know, those are all on the past going into the present day. So many amazing people doing things. Tapestry here, your own, we wrote about one of your own in the OC Weekly this year, going to talk to undocumented detainees in the jail system here in Orange County. You're like, who, me? What? Huh? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. Raise your hand, raise your hand. One of your own, one of those path trailblazers, uh, you know, cutting that path. I know Tapestry has done so much. Uh, your sister or brother congregation in Anaheim, the UU up there, that's some place I've always been associated with ever since I was a teenager or, you know, in my college years. The job is not done. We are still not in progressive paradise just yet, but we need to learn from the people of the past. We need to be among ourselves. We need to create coalitions. We need to know all of, you know, everyone. And even when I told people, yeah, there's this awesome congregation, a Unitary Universalist progressive congregation in Mission Viejo. No one wants to believe me. They think, <laughs> they think, they still think Mission Viejo is a bad, bad place, uh, which, some places are, of course, but not here at Tapestry. But at the, you know, at the same, oh, sorry, at the same, uh, you know, by the same token, there are still people here in Mission Viejo who think Santa Ana is nothing. That Anaheim, there's no reason to go to Anaheim. And so the 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 challenge that I have to you, you know, this month of journeys, we all have our own personal journeys. But I think, we, especially since we're here, we all want to create the same path. We all want to walk the same path of social justice in Orange County, of creating a far a path that goes even further to bring all of us together into this. So know your history, know those trailblazers, become a trailblazer, and more than anything, congregate among ourselves, and let's do this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gustavo. Will the ushers now receive the offering?
Now please stand, if you're comfortable doing so, and join in singing hymn number 347, Gather the Spirit. We extinguish this flame, knowing the light remains in the warmth and compassion of our hearts until we are together once again. Carry with you the love and laughter of this place and let it light your journey and come back, come back to the one universal everywhere and every when and every one inclusive home. Shalom, salam, namaste, and blessed be.